uh, Bring Your Own Lunch program. Uh, my name is Rich. I'm the summer interpreter or tour guide here at Martin's Heritage. And uh, this is a program that I uh, began four years ago. And uh, I know uh, some of you have been coming all this time. I appreciate it. And those of you who are newer to the program, uh, I appreciate uh, your coming as well. And, uh, and uh, I do hope to uh, continue doing this uh, each summer that I am here now. So uh, today, uh, we have a, a colleague of mine uh, from the Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, presenting. Uh, DCR oversees uh, all the area of state parks uh, in Massachusetts, including, of course, right here at uh, Lawrence Heritage. Uh, so we have Dr. Don Kent uh, today uh, from uh, DCR, uh, who will, who's the uh, research director for DCR, and he will be uh, telling you about uh, research, about what he does at DCR, some of the things that, that he's involved in. And uh, so, uh, again, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy today's presentation. We'll have a QA and uh, a afterwards, as we always do. And as always, uh, please feel free to help yourself to uh, the refreshments there on the table. Okay? So, uh, Don, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Rich. Okay, you're welcome. Nice to be here. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. Uh, what I want to do is just give you an overview of uh, research and where we came from, where we're going, what we've been doing, to give you a sense of what's going on at DCR. DCR, I've only been there six months. You know, I brought in to start up the research office, and uh, it's enormously complex agency. It's a big agency with a lot of responsibilities. <coughs> so. Where did it come from? The, the agency went through what they call the strategic readiness initiative a couple of years ago. The idea was, look, you know, the future's coming on like a freight train. We've got to figure out how to deal with it. So they make this nice graphic, which you don't have to read because I've come to a point. So reimagine the future, reimagine what work we're doing, and reimagine um, how we're going to do the work. That's it. You know, that's a big task for you know, our agency, especially when it's complicated in DCR. How does that lead us to research? This was in uh, the writing of submission. Agency wide research agenda. Something we have never had. Knowledge management system. It's a place we can get smart and share and apply research findings. You've probably seen sort of yeah, of course, but they were in place. So. <clears throat> we're also guided on the mission principles. This is where this complexity starts to reveal itself. So <clears throat> we're working on conservation of lands and waters, cultural resources, um, recreation resources, of course. And that's pretty straightforward. You know, we're managing those resources. But it's the tag end of this that's a catch on for the well being of all. So it's not just making sure the trail there, is, that we kept some trees up and forest. It's about ultimately this is all to, to help people be well, which is a, a much more complicated task than going out and cutting a log today or you need to sit down that damaged tree or. Just open the doors for the cultural facility like this one. So, frankly, that's what attracted me to this job is this tagging in the well being of all, the public well being, because of such a challenge. So, so we have a mission, uh, core principles, access to recreation, um, universal access, a program called Universal Access, uh, and sort of lands and waters. Climate change, we're, we're absolutely heavily invested in climate change, and particularly yet mitigating and adapting to it. That again is like a train coming down the tracks, it's affecting everything we do, including the people we serve, support healthy communities, and inspire stewards. Inspire stewards is people like yourselves who recognize that <clears throat> the parks are not the agency's parks, the parks are the people's parks. So 
the best way to make sure you're not only getting the value of that park, it is to get engaged to the park and to think of it as your park, come help, come do some stuff. You yeah, it's just to learn about what's going on today. So research is not new at DCR. It's been going on since 2003, which is when it became DCR before that it was jumble of other acronyms and organizations that kept getting squeezed and adjusted and they finally settled on DCR in 2003. So we've been doing research. There's a lot of smart people at DCR. Um, we apply science, we conducted science, we did research and uh, developed expertise from staff. Some of that research goes on with staff who never realized they were being research scientists, most of them. A lot of it has gone on with external partners. We have, this year alone, we have 60 externally driven research projects coming on. 60 of them. And there's just myself on a research board here right now, trying to keep a lid on this work of staff. And everything. So, um, of course, what we're trying to do is to align that external research with the parks needs, with the properties needs, which in turn means it's aligned with the people's needs. That's where we're going. So we're very lucky to have that back in there. So, one of the first things we did when we opened up the research office was to demystify research. A lot of people have this idea of research, oh, that's what they do in white coats in the laboratory when you're making pharmaceuticals or you're working at a university and you have to do research to meet your requirements of the job. It's not, you know, yes, that's happening, but it, it's a lot more than that. So if we strip it down to the basic, what is research? You collect data. You analyze the data, interpret the data. That's research. Do you do research? Yes, no? Do you, have you ever gone into Amazon to look for a product? Yeah, that's research. Anytime you don't know what you specifically want, you have to figure it out. You're doing research. So that's the mindset we're bringing to DTR. People who never thought of themselves as a, as a researcher, who were maintaining the properties and whatever. We help them understand that if you don't know exactly what you have to do when you go out to do it, you're doing research. Embrace it. So, uh, and the key for all of this is that you're doing it for a purpose. You're trying to figure something out. You're trying to come up with facts. You're trying to reach the conclusions. So, again, we're demystifying. We don't want it to be something others do. We want it to be something that everybody else can see themselves doing. So, why conduct research at all? There's two challenges. <clears throat> Technical challenges, they're pretty easy. I mean, you have to have some skills. But technical challenges means you know what you need to do to solve a problem. You have the tools, or you have the skills. It can be done pretty quickly. That's technical challenges. So, you know, if your sink is leaking, you might know how to, which wrench you need to get under there. You might know how to put the tape in to seal it up again. That's a technical challenge. Adaptive challenges are challenges that you can't just reach in the toolbox. You can go putzing around in your toolbox trying to find one. But you may not find a tool. You might have to invent a new tool. You may have tools, but you don't know how to apply it. So you get back to that process of here. So the scientific method, which they used to teach in school, I don't know if they're still teaching it, but <coughs> scientific method. I have a need. What could meet that need? What might work? Let me try it. Did it work? If it works, I'll do. We just completed a research project. 
it didn't work, what do you do? You circle back, get some more things, and try it. Again, we're demystifying research. So who conducts research? I can give it away. Everybody conducts research. You can't get through life without conducting research. One point or another, you're conducting research. So certainly, we're going to be conducting it at DCR. <clears throat> So why did we create a research office at DCR? Because we're dealing with adaptive challenges. There's some routine stuff, but we're dealing with living organisms, we're dealing with living systems, we're dealing with people, we're dealing with cultural resources. None of that is directly, <clears throat> it doesn't, it's not the same solution every time, in every situation. So we're always adapting. That in the work we do, we're adapting the maintenance we do, we're problem solving all the time. So um, we needed to share our findings with colleagues. I will show you the strategy in a little bit, but um, I'll show you pretty soon. Um, people were working diligently at DCI, working hard, but they're kind of isolated. There was no place for them to say, oh my gosh, I've got to figure this out today. I wonder if somebody else has figured it out. Well, I might ask my colleague who's standing there next to me to go, I don't know. But there was no way to reach through an agency with a thousand people to figure it out if somebody had done it before. Could just, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that was a, a mandate. <clears throat> We have to uh, extend our capacity. He says, if it's two of us, there are some other researchers, uh, or people I guess are doing research throughout the agency, forestry, water quality, water supply. Uh, they are routinely, have routinely been doing what they recognize as research. And then there's hundreds and hundreds of people who didn't think about what they were doing as research. So, capacity was a big issue. One way to overcome capacity or diminish capacity problems is to build partnerships, to collaborate. You can collaborate internally with people who can help you out, or we can reach outside the agency partners. And we are working with, I think we were, we're about 200 different organizations we've partnered with since 2003. So we're always out there fishing. And oftentimes, it does cost us some money. They're looking, they had a need, they want to do research, they want to use our property. Lines up with what our needs are. Free help. So, um, lessons learned, we weren't, we weren't holding on to the information in no such a repository. Um, we needed to do that, that's not what we were doing. And promote stewardship to be more active in engaging people, not just letting them park and off they go, and they go to the swim beach or the little hot room trail, but to engage them at a deeper level about what is it about this park that's so unique. What, what's here to see, what's here to do. So we have a strategy. <clears throat> the first piece is the research management system. And this is where everybody can access information. This is um, it's a dashboard, computerized dashboard. And uh, this particular one, part of it, all of those dots are places we've conducted research on DCR program. This one indicates external research. So universities, NGOs, uh, other state agencies, the federal agencies, everybody in the sun is going to work out our properties. So that's there. We have now created this dashboard as a means for our staff to be able to access that. They can go into this dashboard and say, hey, is there anything going on in my property? Okay, what's going on? All right. What do I need to know about it? Where is it? <clears throat> we can also just ask, uh, is there anything that's related to the problem I'm facing and I don't know how to begin to solve anywhere in our system? We can go in and look at it. 
It always includes uh, a, a description of the research that's been done and the findings. So it's all there. Party study. <clears throat> you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be able to do this, you need to know what to do. Because there's there's 450,000 plus acres of properties, swim beaches, natural swim beaches, pools, forests of many types, uh, endangered species. There's so much going on out there. So you can't do it all at once. What you have to do is figure out what are the priorities right now. And that requires conversations. We come to an agreement, these are priorities. We expend our capacity on that. <clears throat> partnerships, I've been talking about partnerships already. Um, absolutely essential. We are, we are so lucky to be working with Max Audubon and, uh, and uh, Drew New England is a, a very good partner. And a number of universities and the agencies, federal and state, Everybody is cooperating. And what it does, all of us benefit from extending capacity. We couldn't do all the work. The university couldn't do all the work. The federal agency couldn't do all the work. Mass Wildlife couldn't do all the work. Everybody's relying on each other. That's how we're going to get more done than we can just by ourselves. Stewardship, you could read that as engagement. That's engaging people who want to draw people in, give them opportunities to participate in what's going on on the property, whether it's um, kind of a citizen science program where uh, the stewards are learning about what's going on on the property. We benefit because we've got people now who are coming into the property. When people, when people become stewards and they engage with the property, they really do start to think of it as theirs. And that's really what we want. We want to convey that message. Property is yours. Feel free to help us anytime. So we're doing, we're getting burning the trash pickup, which is not exciting, but it's a, it's a must. Uh, you know, we have park serve day. We were out in Revere at Marsh. It was freezing cold in April on Earth Day. But we had a turn on about two dozen people who showed up on this really cold day to census birds. And we'll, we continue that every year or something. So, and we're thinking about more and more ways we can engage people with those types of um, activities. Or, hey, we want them to be, I'll say, I want them to go beyond help us pick up the trash. I want them to be engaged in what's going on in the property. Something fun for people. Right? That's what the social is doing. And <clears throat> the public well being, that really kind of squishy thing. So uh, it's not so squishy. There are ways to do it. Yeah, I think I have some slide. I don't know if still on the slide. But, um, our natural areas in particular are critical to the mental and physical health of people. I, you've probably seen some of the, the reports now. I mean, forestry is something that came up in, in Japan and got studied and studied and studied, talking about research, measuring people's stress levels and cortisol and their heart and everything else. And damn, it doesn't work. It works. You know, go out in the forest, chill out, you'll be healthy. So we have four or 50,000 acres of property, we're, we're teed up to be providing that kind of well-being service to people, whether it's on their own or we're helping with uh, meditation or forest bathing or anything. So we're, we're looking into how we can get into that avenue and, and serve people in that way. The other way that it comes up is uh, urban trees. Particularly in environmental justice neighborhoods, <laughs> you know, there are no trees. It's hot as heck in some of these cities, and 
Well, people don't have air conditioners, they can't afford air conditioners. So one way to help with that is to plant trees, replant trees that used to be there, which are no longer there, in the neighborhoods. So we work with the residents of the neighborhood. We, of course, ask them. We don't just come and start planting trees. We talk to them and say, here, we'd like some trees. You know, do you want to, all right, help us. And they're going to be the youth. Typically, we provide some stipends for youth, but uh, others are volunteers. You have the trees planted, of course, it's going to take a little while. So we're going to cool the neighborhood, makes that neighborhood look aesthetically better, and makes people proud of their neighborhood. And it does reduce electricity costs, which is a big deal, particularly here in a tight way. So. <clears throat> So I promised to uh, talk about some of the drivers for us. So dynamic, I talked to you about the, the research management system. We're expanding that to an internal one. That's our next big step, is to start capturing the research that's going on in, the, in DCR, now that people have been reminded that it is research, and that if you contribute that, we will get that into a dashboard so that your colleagues can look it up and go, oh, they did that at the park down the road. I don't have to invent the wheel. They can help me solve this problem. So, central repository, people could go someplace, get smart. Um, <coughs> what else Up here, we have, uh, you know, probably walking out of the camera. But this is uh, a strategic advisory committee that helps us with what we call forest reserves. Forests that are meant not to be managed heavily. So we use, this is just one example, we have other strategic committees. They're external experts. They help us think things through. Be smart. Uh, new thing. Uh, research symposium. We're going to annual with these now. What we do is we invite staff who've done research and uh, partners who've done research. And we're doing a virtual meeting this year. Uh, and we do about a day's worth of, of uh, getting together and talking about what kind of research is coming on, what's important to us, how we solve the problems, and so forth, internal and external. So. One of the things that Seems just too simple. The agency used to grant permits to people who work on our properties. So we call them research applications. And then we would, if we like it, we would give them a research permit. <clears throat> and I thought, we're trying to be partners with these people. But it sounds regulatory. I hate regulatory. You know, I get it, we need regulatory, but that's not what research should be. It should be regulatory. So, we just changed the language. People now submit research proposals to us. It's not, it's not about permits. It's a research proposal. We've got a great idea. We want to do it on our property. We want to work with some of our staff. Submit a proposal. We made an online system. Go right in, take a look at it quickly, figure out whether it's going to work or not. And then we'll issue a research agreement. What you're going to do, what we're going to do. Maybe on everyone, we're not doing a whole lot. And, uh, it changes the whole mindset of people. They're not like, oh, permit, I hate permits. You know, I hate having to ask permission to go to your property and do something. We took, just wiped it out, just wiped it clean. Now everybody's excited. I had an idea. Can I talk to you about it? Yeah, let's talk about it. Let's see if it's going to work. And it's lock, people flocking in. Ideas from there. So they're not hung up on a permit, they're thinking about what needs to be done. That's what they're doing. Proactive is another one of our buzzwords or mandates. Um, I'll be honest with you, proactive is tough for the big agencies. And the state and the federal agencies. Proactive is tough. Because you usually don't have enough capacity to get ahead of things. Dynamic was about change, which is also tough for everybody. 
but proactive, that means you've got to get ahead of it. You can stop and say, what's coming down the road? And that's where the initiative can help out. Stop, pause, what's going to happen? Climate change is the one that's really underlying everything that's going on on our properties right now, everything that's going on in your lives, frankly. <coughs> so, uh, hot forest, uh, 350,000 acres of forest. I don't know if you have. You know, we do very, very little logging, per se, you know, less than 1% a year. And usually it's associated with, um, oh, that area has been infested and we need to get in there and clean it out now before it takes over all the forest. Pests are coming in. We have half a dozen really nasty bugs that have come into Massachusetts and are just creating havoc on the trees and on forest. Really terrible things to the trees. There's also invasive plants that are coming in. So we're trying to be proactive, we're trying to get, get ahead of it. Um, just on that less green uh, solar panels, we're trying to reduce emissions. Um, and the flip side of that is we're trying to figure out right now in the process of figuring out how to optimize the capture of carbon and on trees. A lot of carbon can be pulled out. It gets captured in a growing tree, it gets stored there. And even more carbon gets stored in healthy soil. The forest, the forest floor is healthy. Um, there'll be a lot of carbon in there too. So we have the opportunity to be a big contributor for the state's uh, climate policies to reduce, reduce emissions, reduce carbon in the atmosphere. So, that's going on at a deep, deeper level right now. <coughs> apply. Our work is, it's got to be applied. I mean, we're, our whole agency is designed to serve people. So, serving people is applied. Drinking water. If you live within the Boston metro area, you depend on Bob and Richard's church, of course. That's where your water's coming from. They, they don't always take care of themselves. They require quite a bit of work to make sure they're not getting contaminated, uh, that we're not losing water someplace else outside the system. One of the big problems that everybody's facing when there's agencies or anything else is um, contamination from groundwater and stormwater runoff. It's really, I mean, you've probably seen the number of beaches that were closed the summer. It was all over the years all the time. Runoff, runoff, runoff. And, and one of our challenges is that we don't own the pool of watershed. Quapa and Massachusetts, we have more control than any other place. We have big pieces of property. On a lot of properties, we just have a property that's surrounded by people doing something else on the outside. And if that right, stormwater is running into our properties. So it's an enormous challenge. We're just starting to work on it and figure out. Because it's never all one solution. Sometimes it's dogs, sometimes it's leaking uh, septic systems, sometimes pipes are busted somewhere. So we're pouring through the data now trying to figure out where's it coming from, can we solve it? Because a lot of people rely on our properties for cooling off in the summer. Again, we're back to environmental, what they call environmental justice communities. They, can't, they don't have pools. They don't have access. They don't have the PMC. They've got to go find a place to get in the water and cool off in there. Um, see, endangered species, cardinal's not endangered, but that's biodiversity. Biodiversity is one of those nebulous terms that is critically important. Biodiversity is the accumulation of all the species, plants, animals, microbes, and so forth, in a system. Those, those systems have to operate at full capacity to be healthy, or everything starts to break down. If 
far worse and more healthy as a system. They didn't have the wildlife, they didn't have the microbes, they didn't have uh, soil, soils. A forest would break down. We can't just say, oh, you know, um, one of the things that one of our challenges is maximizing the storage of carbon in trees. Well, there's a, there's a way to do that if you think of trees and carbon and you don't think of anything else. You think, all right, then we need a whole bunch of old, very large trees. But that ignores the system that keeps that force. You, have, you can't just go, oh, big trees, there you You have to think about, well, I need a lot of diversity to keep the whole system up there or those trees are just going to die, and when trees die, they release the carbon. So there's, they have to manage, and frankly, we've, we've been managing since before Columbus came. <clears throat> you know, that no longer does the system run itself. We're in the middle of the system. We've, we've done our cost our impacts on the system. We've kind of produced a situation where we, where we have to manage <laughs> Bats, we just had some bats that were, uh, became federally endangered that were on properties in Rock, Massachusetts. We're digging in on that, helping <coughs> people understand uh, where those bats are, how many are they, what can we do to prevent them from going extinct, and, and in a more practical way, uh, how do we avoid violating the Endangered Species Act? By, by the environment killing And here's that uh, on the right, that's a picture of some of the tree plant <coughs> And the application is reduce electricity costs to cool neighborhoods. And inclusive. <coughs> to me, this is probably the most important. So those turtles up on the upper left are land shortles, they're endangered. Well, we're going to use them uh, on several of our properties. They're doing an amazing thing, an amazing job. Uh, I'm not trekking around in the months in the marsh. I work, so I'm capturing turtles. But uh, they take another step, not just how many turtles are there, where are they nesting, and oftentimes they're nesting in somebody's lawn, which is which is weird, but the turtles go look for the right soil. So they literally walk away from their bodies through forest, that forest doesn't have the right sand, right soil, the same soil. They'll just wander in the neighborhoods, they'll cross the roadways, you know, on that big in a nest, somebody's flower garden. So we have to engage people to protect the, 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 the nest. So, we're working on this, but the really cool part about this is that Zoom <coughs> is head starting these native turtles. Head starting means they're taking out some young ones and uh, they're giving them schools, teaching the schools how to raise them until they get to a certain size. <coughs> and then the class goes back out to, to the pond releases them to the wild. That is so cool. I mean, there was another program going on with uh, dragonfly monitoring. Uh, dragonflies are good indicators of mercury, which we don't want in the habitat. But <coughs> we need an indicator that's pretty easy to check. So, uh, again, classes, school classes, they can do some capturing of uh, Dragon flies. To me, that's, that's as good as it gets. When you start tying to your research to education opportunities, that's, that's it. Uh, pollinators, we've been pushing um, pollinators in the growing wild program. We distribute seeds, we talk to classes, we talk to neighborhoods about the benefits of growing some of the flower plants that we try to pollinate, which you probably all know. We've had some real scares of losing bees. And uh, without bees, we're not getting food. We want that be so.
So, that's all I have for graphics for you. <laughs>